What's up? What's going on? Arvind Ram Krishna here, and welcome to Driven to Draw, where I teach you how to bring your sketches to life. Let's get started. Hey, what is up? What's going on? Arvind Ram Krishna here, and welcome to Driven to Draw. I've got a great interview lined up today. We're going to be talking to John Fry, who has been drawing vehicles since he could hold a crayon, which led him to graduate from the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, California. His past work has been with Activision, Hasbro, Boeing, John Deere, among others. And John is currently group leader for the digital modeling and visualization at Honda R&D and has been with the company for more than 20 years. What an outstanding career that is. He is also an instructor for the vehicle and mech design for video games, movies, and toys at Concept Design Academy in Pasadena. So we've got uh, a lot of things to talk about, so I want to welcome John. Hey, John. Hey, welcome to uh, Driven to Draw. I can't tell you... Uh, uh, how thrilled I am to, to see you and to, to actually uh, get to know you a little bit better and to ask you a, a lot of questions. I mean, you are an extreme talent. I am just amazed at the, the level of work that you've been putting out. I mean, I've seen a lot of your stuff uh, out on Instagram, and I've even read uh, a lot about you, actually, and seen one of the articles that was posted about you on, on Jalopnik on the Sprumeister and some of the, the model kit designs that you've been coming up with. And uh, I think it's been, uh, it, it's just, it's fantastic. A lot of the stuff that I've seen so far, the level of detail, not just from the artistic standpoint, but just your level of design sense and your design vocabulary is really uh, pretty amazing. And I want to just kind of jump through and just start off with, talking about your background if you can kind of tell our audience uh, a little bit about yourself and your background and how you kind of get started okay yeah well thanks for having me on I, uh, my pleasure to share always and you know you're one of the guys that just just has such a great pleasure in you know creating and drawing you know there's so many people that you know they get into the industry and they draw at work and then they shut off when they go home and you know there's a few people that have the passion they just can't get enough of it and you know we just love to sketch all the time so <laughs> appreciate uh, it yep yeah but i've been that way all my life i mean you're probably the same way but you know it's as one of the first things that i just loved to do honestly as a kid was just draw and um one of my things was was cars from an early age so cars and uh, I loved army stuff for some reason um, kind of had interest in uh, you know all the details of the army vehicles the the wheels the the lugs on the wheels and um, you know any any of the toys that had lots of little details and stuff on them that's what really appealed to me you know you know that mechanical you know I don't know what the mechanical stuff is at that that age but it really interested me so you know when I first started drawing as a kid, like in kindergarten, um, <laughs> you know, I, I draw like a side view of a car. I started to draw the three quarter view of a car. Right. And you know, I, I draw an army Jeep and it's like, there's stuff, you know, you draw the wheel and you draw the wheel well, and then the, the wheel goes up and down. And then inside there, there's all sorts of interesting stuff in there. And I would, I would kind of draw that, you know, there's a spring or something, or there's some structure. Yeah. You know, I just, I just was kind of obsessed with the detail. A little bit maybe unnaturally but. did you take things apart you take all your toys apart and just try to get into yeah. it, even even as yeah. part of that detail to kind of understand how things kind of fit together yeah sure yeah absolutely and my dad was uh is very mechanically savvy so um he knew you know how to fix pretty much anything so um he also had an artistic bent to him although he didn't get into an artistic um kind of job or career did he work on cars, or did was he did he like working on his own cars and trying to fix those up, or? Yeah, yeah, he's got a pretty amazing skill, and uh, you know, he's got his first Camaro that he bought back in '67, still has it, and it looks pretty much brand new. And you know, pretty much anything in the house, the house itself, is just immaculately maintained. You know, he's got a real skill for it. Um, but that kind of interest on how things work and, and uh, the history of things, 
uh, has always appealed to me as well. So a lot of people, you know, they focus on the future thing, but I think uh, kind of knowing the history of things is really important as a designer as well. So um, I kind of picked that up as well as just kind of researching, you know, World War II airplanes and uh, uh, like tanks and stuff and uh, racing history going back to the early 1900s interests me. You know, there's there's all sorts of stuff. Like the, the catchphrase at design school is like everything's been done. Like you come up with some ideas, like a, you put a fin on a car or something weird or something, and it's like, yeah, it's been done. They pull up a sketch or pull up some Eastern European car that, that did it. And everything's been done, but um, it seems like it's just a way of combining things into some new way is how you kind of create mm-hmm. new things. And then, you know, taking things out of nature, maybe and mixing them up. But, uh, yeah, so to kind of go back to your question, drawing from an early age like crazy and never stopping and having kind of this weird um, kind of mental, physical need to be drawing or creating. So, you know, if I wasn't drawing, I was working with Legos, building Legos all the time. Um, Did you, on when you were building Legos, were you... Yeah, because my kids love to, you know, I I get all the Lego sets and stuff for my kids. And I know yeah. that, you know, my currently my, my 10-year-old, they're always trying to do something different. So they may even get the Lego kits and they'll try to build it up like it's supposed to be even when they follow the instructions. But then, yeah. you know, Rohan will try to go in and just try to knock something out off of his own. Or he'll just take parts from another Lego set and then combine it to something else to do something new. It actually drive me nuts <laughs> at first because yeah. all these parts were all over the place. And I, I'd always say, it's like, man, I mean, after a while, if you want to sell this thing, you're not going to have any pieces. But I mean, it, yeah. it, it kind of got me thinking that, you know what, this is this is where that creative, that mindset starts. It's Yeah, that's just the it's, process. It's yeah, like you build no it rules. once, all the parts just go into the parts bin and then you're kit bashing from that yep. point on and is Think that what it. you pretty much did most of the time when oh, you? Were... yeah yeah of course you know lego wasn't as uh, advanced back then either so you know they they didn't make new pieces you know by the hundreds every year so you're kind of building with the same stuff and you know when i started out they didn't have uh anything except for the the mondrian uh, colored pieces, which is what they started out with as their whole idea. They looked at Piet Mondrian's paintings, and they had yellow, red, white, black, uh, and then they had clear. Um, but they didn't have, like, green except for, like, the base plates and trees or something. But, like, they didn't have gray. So the space stuff kind of happened in the late 70s, I think. And then uh, nowadays you can just buy it in bulk online, so... You know, I, I kit bash every once in a while, and I'll just buy, like, bulk white pieces and gray pieces so I don't have to, you know, color code stuff. I can just kind of build out of the same piece. It's interesting because I've seen, I think, some of the stuff that I've seen on Facebook, for instance. I've, you've posted some things where you've you've made models off of Legos themselves. And yeah. do you take them? I mean, and and some of those things are are pretty extravagant. It almost looks like you you got them off of kits, but you're really kit bashing. Now, do you use that and then take those and create your own designs after that? So you use that kind of as your your preliminary inspiration, and then try to go back and and try to to render something or knock something out. Well, that was my first idea. What I was going to do is um, kind of use as a three D. Um, base to draw over, but you know I got so into just building it. I started to get bu- bigger and bigger builds, so like you know, like four feet long wow. kind of stuff. And then <laughs> I think I have a really short attention span, probably thanks to the internet these days. So, <laughs> but done with the yeah. ship, I'm not interested in rendering over. And then you know the level of finish is good enough. It's just like well, let's just call it Lego. But um, I, I did do a couple that were kind of like more kind of palm sized ones, and then I drew over those because those are like something you can build in like 15 minutes or something just yeah. to get a map. Um, and then you kind of on Lego it and try to turn it into a rendering of some sort. I'm just always interested in some different process, you know. 
How long does it take? How long does it take you to create the uh, the larger scale ones when you're working with those Lego sets and? Um, just I'm kind of working them like off and on in the evenings after work and on the weekends sometimes. So you know, I think the last one I probably worked on for a couple of weeks off and on. Just have to you know clear out a big space for it, and then you know I I keep it around for a while and then you know clean up and put it all in boxes. <laughs> It's fun. It's just another creative outlet, really. So going back to like, um, like growing up. Yeah. So the the two things, and I don't know if I can segue into the the book stuff at an early oh, age. Oh yeah, was, sure. Um, but this this is the book that really changed my life. So the Empire Strikes Back sketchbook. <laughs> so growing up in the 1970s, you have to understand, you know. A lot of people these days that grew up in like the 90s and beyond, yeah. they're pretty spoiled. So much content of quality design work that's out there. I agree. Uh, video games, movies, you know, how many different sci-fi series are there even on TV that are pretty decent? But like um, at the time, I was watching MASH on TV um, just because I love the, the military stuff. And there's a uh, another show called Black Sheep Squadron. It was like a F4U Corsairs in World War II in the, the Pacific. And, uh, you know, watching old uh, World War II movies with my dad. And uh, sci-fi, there was nothing on TV that was really interesting to me. I um, And then Star Wars came out and kind of blew my mind. Because, like, at an early age, not seeing anything in that genre of any sort of quality. And it was just like, I think it did bend a lot of minds and forge a lot of careers at that point. So to me, you know, I, I was drawing cars up to that point and, um, you know, I just started drawing star Wars stuff for the next several years. Um, not thinking about a career in it so much, but, uh, so again, this, this book, um, actually for the, the second Star Wars movie that came out, Empire Strikes Back. I got this. It's penciled in here uh, on my birthday in 1980, so I would have been about eight years old. <laughs> and it it has these uh, sketches in it that are um, in the industrial design style. So right, uh, pen and marker on vellum. Though I didn't know how it was done at the time. I thought it was pen and maybe watercolor or something. I was trying to figure it out. Yep. Um, the gray markers, but, um, right? Yeah, I, I was like, okay, so there's a process to all this stuff. <laughs> but I thought, you know, once Star Wars is over, you know, there's the three guys that worked on this project. That's a very difficult career to get into, never realizing that it's a whole um, other kind of world. And so another book I got for a birthday, probably maybe actually the same year, maybe Christmas so that same year is Rapid Vids. <clears throat> and this, I think they still have a version of it, but if you get the, the old version, the mm -hmm. cover that looks like this, it's better. Um, and this was uh, produced by a couple of um, ID instructors at uh, BYU um, in Utah. And it's got all these exercises in here, and it's all industrial design stuff. And so not knowing anything about industrial design, I got this book and I opened mm -hmm. it up, and it's like, this is the same kind of sketching that's in Star Wars. So I'm like, there actually is a career in this. And so I kind of understood, like, well, if you don't draw spaceships, you could be drawing toasters or... Yeah. Or, How you know, old were you at that art. time when you were looking at all these books? Uh, like eight, ten years old. Wow. So I... So it made I was, a pretty big impression, even at that time, that you were oh, really yeah. fixated onto industrial design and... Transportation yeah. design, entertainment design, way back, way back then. How did they? How did you start to kind of practice? And then when you started reading those books and start to implement and just start drawing and and how often did you draw? Uh, all the time. I, I drew all the time for sure. So I was kind of like the artistic kid in the class. Like whenever I was in school, so did all sorts of. You know, I seized upon any art project that we had, whatever it was. And then, then at home, I was drawing Star Wars stuff and, and cars, you know, just vehicle-centric stuff all the time. And then, um, yeah, the same mind, I was thinking about a career. And I didn't want to be a uh, uh, like a Van Gogh 
I, th I think another thing that probably kind of uh, messed with my brain a little bit is seeing um, a movie called Lust for Life with uh, Kirk Douglas. Yeah. I don't know when I saw that, but but I knew pretty early on that it's like, you know, there was this artist and he's one of the greatest artists in the world and basically cut off his ear and then got depressed and killed himself and <laughs> never made any money. So I'm like, I, don't, I don't think I want to be a painter for some reason. You know, when you're young, you just kind of lump everything into, like, uh, one category. I guess. Well, I guess that's how it is. So, um, But at the same time, I'm uh, watching... Holy crap. Uh, oh, man. <laughs> I watched the, the Brady Bunch, and I'm like, well, this guy's making pretty good money. Maybe I could be an architect or something. So yeah. I, I didn't know, and, you know, rightfully so, pre-internet and not knowing anybody in the industries in a small town, um, like what are all these other jobs? So it's like, oh, architect. And then I figured out, oh, graphic designer. Okay, that's something. But like the industrial design thing was very mysterious. Like I didn't know about it. I knew about the sketching style. Mm -hmm. So, um, Did you live in California at that time? No, I was up in Oregon, central Oregon, small okay. town. Okay, all right. Um, but my, my parents knew about my kind of artistic tendencies and my yeah. love for it. You know, I was, I had some skill, you know, a, a kid, kid skill, but nonetheless, they kind of kept their eyes open and, you know. So they were very want... supportive about it, right? Yeah. About, okay. And my mom tracked down um, Art Center from uh, Sunset Magazine, which is, you know, some household magazine of some sort, but they used to sponsor projects at Art Center. So they do articles about it. And so... She's looking at this like, well, this this is a school where they teach you how to be a car designer. And, you know, what is design is, you know, not engineering necessarily. There's two aspects of it. So engineers call themselves designers. Stylists call themselves design, designers, but they're very yeah. different jobs. And that styling thing is really what um, was my career. That was what I was kind of headed towards, even not knowing that at the time. So that I figured out in junior high school. I figured out this is the career, okay, I'm gonna aim for it. And so, you know, I had junior high and high school to prepare for that. And I had some pretty good teachers, hmm. mechanical drawing teacher that, you know, I took the mechanical drawing stuff, did that, but at the same time, he's, he understood that um, I had this talent to do, you know, sketching stuff, which wasn't part of the ID or the mechanical drawing curriculum so mm -hmm. he let me kind of do side kind of projects and i drafted up cars inside view and then i would kind of draw them in perspective and start to render them and um picking up every magazine i could, could that had like some sketch in that and try to emulate that what were some but of the magazines what, that you read then at that time um automobile and uh, road and track had the best uh, sketches in them and there was few and far between, you know, there would only be like two or three sketches in each issue. Yeah. Um, and they're like three inches big. So um, you kind of look at them and try to figure out how they're doing things. I thought everything was airbrushed. Um, so I was, I was, you know, just kind of guessing at, you know, the scale of, of how they're doing it. You could see the marker work, didn't know the paper or anything, and just kind of, kind of guessing at how they did things. But at the same time, you know, materials aside you're still learning how to draw so you can you can learn how to draw with charcoal on on a rock and draw you know cars on, on a rock if you want um, you know the fundamentals are there um, and then it's just the final level of finish when you get to you know using the proper materials that you learn later agreed um, how, so you enter art center what was yep. that experience like because art center obviously a very intense school right i mean they really try to erase a lot of the bad habits that you may have started they they look at the raw talent they see that there's potential for students and then you go through a process of unlearning bad mm -hmm. habits and then being groomed to to become a pro, pro uh, you know proficient designer uh yeah. focused on a certain type of sketching right so what was yeah. that what was that experience like and did you have any struggles along the way as you're going, as you're attending Art Center? Um, well, I, I did two years community college first, so I wasn't, you know, 
too young, which is, is often the problem for a lot of people. So I, I was pretty ready for it. Mm. And uh, my skill level was pretty high going in. And I think that was actually maybe a, uh, maybe a little bit of a problem for me because Why? Um, I went in there and everybody, everybody had to work pretty hard and I, I didn't work that hard. And I always kind of regret that I didn't work harder. <laughs> so I'm I'm one of the few people that never pulled any all nighters in design wow. in school, and I, I always feel that I maybe I, I should have. But I and another thing, a problem that I had is I, I fixated on the art of everything, yeah. and um, I didn't. I think I had been teaching myself, you know, the process of creating and um, art, you know, and you know, viscom kind of technique that I didn't understand, uh, like being a designer. So styling process, what is good design and that I was a little bit deficient in. Um, and then probably the other thing is I'm not a great salesman. You know, that's one of the things it takes to be a great designer is being a great salesman. And there are plenty of, um, really successful designers that don't draw that well, but they're excellent, um, thinkers. Yeah. And, and salesmen, they can sell a design, they can explain it, they can understand it. So um, that's one of the things that probably I struggle with a little bit. Um, but, man, it was it was so fun. And, you know, I, I'm i always nostalgic for going back there and taking classes again. Just, you know, it was such a great time because you're, for the first time, you know, college is like this for a lot of people, but you go in there and this is the first time that you're in a room full of you know, 20 people that have a similar mindset, you know, you're, you have the same loves and, and kind of, you know, passions. Um, and at the same time, everybody comes from different backgrounds. So they have all sorts of different things that they've been exposed to. So when I went there, you know, being from a small town, not knowing about, uh, like Japanese anime robot design or whatever, because I was never on TV when I was growing up. And so all these kind of industrial design influences from different places, you know, hot rod guides. Sure. You know, I saw hot rods as a kid, but I didn't grow up around them. So there's there's guys that are totally into hot rods, and they had that background that kind of fed to it. So it's this giant melting pot of um, influences and, um, you know, all the guys that kind of came before in the industry, you know, the great designers, you start to learn their names. Because, you know, there's all these cars you see you don't, you know the people behind them uh, until you kind of kind of get into that world I think that's a that's a really good point because I think that when you get surrounded by a pool of talented designers that have different backgrounds and different interests you sort of feed off of that right because you start to collectively start to to look at each other's work and see what kind of influences and see what kind of interests that they have and how you can leverage some of that stuff to kind of affect your work as well. Uh, but it, actually, looking at your work now, it sounds like you were ahead of the curve quite a, quite a bit when you started. Yeah, maybe just a different curve. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, not not being such so much of a salesman. Um, like, I didn't get a job in a car company right out when I came out of school. Really? Um, yeah, so... Um, I messed around. I, I got a job at Activision in Santa Monica mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, kind of keeping with what I really enjoy doing, you know, just drawing vehicles for a video game project. And I got this giant stack of paper and just completely filled it with different vehicles for this uh, kind of hovercraft um, wasteland game, which never got made. Uh, so first introduction to the, the real world of design is, you know, the majority of the stuff that you create, you know, doesn't become anything. So, you know, for every car, there's, you know, hundreds of sketches that basically are just kind of to get to that one final design, you know, stuff that gets tossed. And yeah. then, of course, there's all the projects that never even get made in the first place. So all the, the work for that, you know, kind of gets thrown away. And I kind of learned that at Art Center early on as well. It's like you're not creating art. You know, it's, um, you know, the, the drawing you put on the wall, uh, it's trash, really. You know, you can't get that attached to it. Um, it's kind of the way it is. So uh, it was like a half year later that I got um, um, 
called up to go to Honda, which is, you know, the, the company that I wanted to go to. Um, I didn't want to go to Detroit. I wasn't familiar with the city at all. And, you know, I wanted to stay out on the West Coast because, you know, that's where I'm from. Yep. And all the, the instructors that I had at, at Art Center that were from Honda, you know, they were the, the best guys, you know, most talented, you know, kind of the funnest guys to work with. So uh, Ricky Sue, um, Dave Merrick, uh, a guy named Catalan who did like the, the first big odyssey, the MDX. Um, he's got all sorts of, you know, really important um, Honda products under his belt there. Um, but it's like, yeah, that's where I want to go to, to work. And, uh, yeah, I heard stories. Yeah, it's near the beach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's seven miles or something. But, uh, you know, that, that was where I wanted to go. That's where I ended up. But, you know, I got hired on to do alias uh, modeling. Um, and I was, you know, before I even started Art Center, it's like I wanted to be in a design studio. I didn't care if I was emptying waste baskets or whatever. I just wanted to be in that place. You know, I, I didn't have to go to that level necessarily, but um, uh, they gave me an offer to do Alias, and, you know, I had a little bit in school. We didn't learn that that much back then. We just had, like, a single mm-hmm. class, and, and I thought it was a great opportunity because I could draw, but I thought that my 3D skills were, were lacking, and I thought if I start to do, like, um, 3D modeling, you know, that's a really good way to kind of round me out as a designer. And, uh, you know, it worked out really good. And so as an alias guy, I uh, um, did a lot of different things. I, I did do, you know, sketching on projects and, you know, was a project leader for design for um, a couple projects, a couple show cars, and uh, learned a whole lot about surfacing on a car, you know, quality of reflections, how, how reflections work, um, you know, how data gets done. And then, you know, when you get into the industry, you learn everything about, you know, how difficult it is to make a car, you know, a good quality car. You know, it's not, you know, a guy, you know, doing sketches and then, you know, an engineer somewhere. It's a giant team of, uh, you know, really smart people who are all doing their own part, you know. They they have their own role in the process from all the market research, researching the, uh, the competition, you know, researching the current project or the current product and seeing how the customer likes it, how they live with the, the products. And, you know, it, it all is pretty amazing that it all comes together. It's such a complicated, you know, uh, product. It's one of the most complicated products that consumers interact with, really. I mean, this is like military-level stuff in terms of part count and uh, yeah. reliability technology. It's... Um, how it's, did... it's always invigorating to kind of just go into work every every day, really. I look forward to it every day. That's awesome. That's awesome. How did um, modeling help you with understanding feasibility, right? Because there's always that delicate balance, obviously, between styling, <laughs> right, between the aesthetics and trying to, to make sure that, you know, the designs and the sketches that you come up with, they all have to be kind of grounded to... Uh, the feasibility and the packaging, right? Because you, you have a, a, a particular platform that you got to design to. And, and most of the time, unless it's, it's, it's a completely brand new vehicle and not carryover, you got to work with the existing body in white, you know, subject to maybe some changes and things that you decide to make. But how did, um, how did packaging or, or surfacing maybe help you with the feasibility portion of it and it and if it and and then if you kind of fast forward through your career you know what are the things that you think that some of the students uh should be learning a little bit more of yeah i think the important thing about that is um after you've gone through a few projects you realize how um important it is to you know communicate and collaborate and work together to get to an end goal because nothing is compromised in car design In good car design. You know, you're looking at, uh, of course, styling, make it look good. So you understand, understand that when you come out of school, but then safety, um, reliability, um, 
weight, cost, um, for exterior parts of the cars, there's the aero stuff. Uh, you know, what's the drag of it? So you're looking at fuel efficiency. Yep. So all these things um, have an importance in the designs. So, you know, you create that first go at something. So if it's like a, a mirror housing on the outside of the car, you know, a single part has an enormous amount of feasibility. And, you know, compared to when you know, I was just starting, it was a mirror that had a motor in it so you could adjust it from the inside of the car. You know, that was pretty much as sophisticated as it got. And then, you know, the ones that kind of flip in. So if you're parking um, or if they're shipping it. So for domestic cars, um, they didn't have flip-in mirrors uh, early on because when they used to put them on the cargo ships to transport them to sell, then they needed to flip the mirrors in. But nowadays, pretty much every car has them. So now you have um, lane change cameras, uh, sensors, um, so you have all these things to package around. At the same time, a mirror is a very critical part of uh, uh, the aerodynamics of the car. So it's, it's pretty small, so you're not getting a lot of drag out of it. But at the same time, the wind is hitting it and yeah. right by your ear. So if it's deflecting air into the, the side glass, you know, there's a buffeting sound. And it increases the wind noise. And yeah. so the that kind of thinking has to go into it so you have to change angles of things and then when you think about you know manufacturability of a part you know how does it pop out of a mold so all these things are kind of coming at you in different directions everybody has their their different needs all the different teams and um your job of course is always to bring it all together and make it uh, look good so even when you have the initial sketch, um, you have to understand that the the process of being a designer um, is working through all that and coming up with a good solution. That's that's the magical part of it. Is like when you come up with that, it's like, wow, this looks great, and it hits all of our uh, needs. You know, that's that's really important. Um, so, as a young designer going to school, I think what you need to understand is. Um, when somebody makes you sketch over a package, for example, um, that's all important stuff that's not going to go away. So you can you can skip that and just make the, the super cheated giant wheel uh, chopped greenhouse sketch and make it look good and get it picked. But at some point, you have to put people in there and you have to put reasonable tires um, and so you can have a comfortable ride in it. So if you kick the can down the road for too long, it's just going to get harder and harder harder to solve those problems so um being able to have the mentality of solving problems from the earliest uh part of the design process is really essential to being a good designer oh uh, yeah completely agree one thing and i don't know whether you can even discuss this but one thing i would have to say is that i've noticed a, a pretty big shift with with honda and their styling because you know, typically I've seen a lot of uh, conservative movement with their styling and not taking a lot of chances. But I have to say that, and we were talking about this earlier, that uh, even the Honda Accord now that's coming out, I have been really surprised and, and pleasantly surprised at how beautifully the, the styling is turning out. And they're really taking some big chances. I think all manufacturers are kind of in the same boat for... Um, what they have to do to kind of keep relevant in the market we have right now. Yep. So, I mean, there's a, there's a pretty big shift right now away from, uh, sedans and coupes. I mean, so it was, it was kind of happening in the nineties a little bit, mm -hmm. early two thousands, the SUV boom, but now it's like, um, it's bigger than ever. Like selling sedans is, is very, very difficult. So, um, you know, making an attractive car is, is very important, I guess. I mean, I want to shift gears a little bit and I want to talk about some of the fun stuff that you've been kind of posting. Uh, a lot of the designs and some of the things that you've been doing on your free time and, and at night and just really exploring the creative side and just uh, what's really nice about it is just that you, you got full freedom to explore without having the constraint of, of what you typically do at work. And that's kind of where all the creative juices kind of flow because it's, it's one of those 
things that kind of feed back the things that you'd even do at work is that you still need a little bit of of extra creativity where you're not constrained and we're not limiting yourself to the things that you want to do and that's something that even charges me up when I see a lot of your work and I want to bring some of the things up here that uh, uh, that I've been looking at especially the stuff that you've got now John's got uh, his work on artstation.com and I'll post a link up for for all of this for you guys to see but he's got um, it's 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 artstation.com forward slash fry f r y e and John has this incredible design vocabulary and one of the things I want to talk about is the Sprumeister which was um, a, a lot of this work from what I remember was was featured on Jalopnik and it was and 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 basically folks when you when you look at these these renderings they're they're basically uh, these model kits he's he, John's kind of taken uh, a lot of the things that you see from the past when people buy model kits over at the stores and especially you know growing up from you know the 70s and 80s when you used to just buy all these uh, different kits from spaceships Star Wars all that stuff and you've created something really uh, pretty phenomenal and unique here so one of the things that I that I really liked what I was looking at was the um, was the uh, McLandish. So I want to know if you can maybe talk a little bit about uh, some of these concepts here. Okay. So the whole idea behind it, um, I'm always trying to do some some new thing, of course, and you know, mixing kind of existing things up in a new way is kind of a, a good way to kind of come up with some new ideas. Um, at the same time, I was thinking about this whole idea of doing kind of an alternate universe kind of scenario. So it's not uh, future necessarily, uh -huh. um, but it's like if there had been another time frame where something else had happened. So my initial kind of run through when I was just kind of thumbnailing out and doing little tiny sketches was uh, this kind of, early 1900s race series where they uh, there wasn't World War One, you know, it was, it was a it was a peaceful early 1900s. So um, all that kind of technology that would have gone into making warplanes went into race cars. So uh, they started to get into doing aero in the early 1900s, which in real life didn't happen until the late 1960s. So they're they're putting on a, like biplane wings to get some downforce on those. And then I, I started doing kind of um, these kind of lay down uh, position cars so that the driver's not sitting high up like you'd see in an early 1900s Grand Prix car. Mm -hmm. um, but just to get a different aesthetic, you know, moving the driver to get a different look out of it. So some familiar elements with the tire technology that existed in the time and kind of the same engine size and everything. Um, but then having the driver look through a, like a brass periscope. And so he's looking at it kind of like a refracted display <laughs> that um, reflected onto a mirror in his lap, and he's like laying down because uh, they're trying to get like less drag or something. Um, so that kind of went forward, and I I drew a sketch where it was a, like a six wheel like Tyrrell kind of car. So early 1900s, but like in the um, Elf Tyrrell colors with six wheels. And for some reason, I just drew it without you know, having a driver in it. It's like, well, what if this thing is radio control? And I didn't really have an idea behind it. So that led into the Sprumeister stuff, which I, I thought that this was a concept I wanted to take into more finished work. And so uh, the McClandish was like the second one I did. And wow. everything refers to some existing car. So there's a familiarity with the, like the sponsorship colors or the name is a little bit twisted. And a lot of these I think up when I'm, I'm on my commutes, like when I'm driving home after work, I'm like kind of like uh, mix yeah. some, not McLaren, it's, uh, I go through a whole bunch of them and there's always a little bit of a, a humorous aspect to it, I'm sure. Um, and that one, you know, I messed around, the early version had red wheels and then I think probably the one that went on Art Station, I changed it to black maybe. But that one is kind of, it's a pretty good example of the whole theme of that series. Yeah. So there's some consistencies depending on whether it's late 60s or getting to the, the 70s or 
I think there's maybe some 80s ones that I'll be working on. But uh, they generally all have the skinny front tires, the big, fat, wide 70s Grand Prix tires, open open wheel, just like F1. Um, they have a pod, like a sensor pod in the back, which mm-hmm. uh, I kind of want to put their, put that into it so, like, mass-wise, there's an interesting profile to it. And then having a cutout shape where the driver would be, um, you know, it's something that a, a normal driven car wouldn't have so it really kind of um pushes that kind of unusual aspect of it so there's familiar aspects of it and then there's some kind of really surprising kind of uh it might might be a little bit jarring to some people um but also like the whole wheel and tire thing that i I try to keep pretty consistent refers back to uh like tea bucket hot rods and the whole hot rod kind of aesthetic so um the the tall, narrow engine box, kind of like early Grand Prix cars, but also like you know, 32 Ford kind of, kind of look as well. So it's a whole bunch of stuff just kind of mixed, mixed up together. And uh, the McLaren is supposed to be like one of the most high tech ones, and so the, the version you see on the box lid is like a test version. So the, the side panel has been removed. So they're, they're accessing the engine, or they're testing some different aero stuff on there as well. And then uh, also for this whole series, the, the whole idea with the aerodynamics is that uh, downforce is essentially banned. So you can have aerodynamic devices on a car, but mm-hmm. when tested in a wind tunnel, it basically has to be pretty neutral. So you can't have like 150 pounds of downforce on each wheel as a result. <laughs> it's got to be you know, neutral, so you know, it's more of a um, computer driving skill events like the passing is a little more exciting the cars are kind of skidding around you know those little skinny front tires they they probably understeer quite a bit and and they got to really juice the power to get the the rears to break loose so you know i I would imagine that the racing could be pretty pretty interesting in theory (laughs) yeah i'm looking at this stuff and i i just love the process you've got some form studies you got the mass and perspective studies that you're flushing out beforehand and even just the exploration of color uh, for the wheels and stuff mm-hmm. uh, really uh, amazing like stuff and and the other thing is that so when I'm when I'm looking at this the the level of detail I mean even even in the area where you've got the where you, you got the engine you've got all this mechanical stuff going on are you rendering every part of that are you able to are you how do you go about looking at a reference to even materialize some of this stuff? It's all out of the head, really. I mean, you know, at, at this point in my life, I've got so much kind of mental reference jammed in there. I wow. Really don't have anything. Um, you know, I, I've spent a lot of evenings just poring over books, but I, I usually don't um, like have a piece of scrap next to me when I'm drawing something, unless it's something I'm not familiar with. Yeah. So like that, that whole world I've been engrossed in it for so long that I've just got all sorts of ideas bouncing around there. I'm just kind of, you know, I know what, how to do any sort of material rendered or, you know, any type of finish. And I know a lot of the different kind of eras of racing, all the famous cars and stuff. So I have kind of the graphic, color schemes my mind um but it's only if i have some project when i'm doing something not so familiar like um like sailing ships or something where i really have to do some research beforehand and maybe put together a pinterest board for research which so i always recommend my students do that to learn um one one other thing it's just uh, another segue is like um for reference, like some of these, these DK books, yeah, are like super, super good. So you can get one on like boats or space or all sorts of technology. But they, you know, here's here's something about like jetliners or something. And so you can kind of educate yourself pretty quick on the basics of things. Yeah. Um. And so that that kind of helps me. So I, I have a really big 
uh, reference library. And having a physical book compared to, you know, just looking at stuff on the internet, it's, yeah. it's a different process. Because, you know, you know, before I go to bed, you know, I'll, I'll bring a book with me and I'll just kind of, you know, pour over it and just mm-hmm. get those images in my mind for a project I'm working on or something. And you seem to absorb it a little bit differently that way. So when you have these books, or maybe it was a more of a practice when you were younger, would you just take the books and just draw what you see to kind of familiarize yourself with it? And then that's kind of what... Is that what helps you to solidify your visual vocabulary and be able to recall and use that? Or do you just read it and then you just replicate it in a different way when you're designing something? Yeah, when I was a kid, you know, I, was, I did the Star Wars stuff for literally years. And so I was I was sketching from, you know, reference books on that and, and copying all that stuff. And then, you know, I'd look at racing books and sketch that and... Yeah, I kind of got out of doing that. So, like, when you go to art school, and, you know, there's a pretty good discussion about this on the, um, the Three Point Perspective podcast, which is uh, um, Jake Parker and uh, Will White, another guy. It's a really good podcast. You want to look, look it up. Uh, but they're basically saying in the, like, the Renaissance era or whatever, you know, all those guys – they learned by copying masters There's master studies and they still do an illustration, but the design kind of curriculum, like at art centers, like we really didn't do that. Like we always had to be like making our own designs. So like these days I, I don't really copy from other stuff to learn things. I, I think I, I should probably, I think it would help. I would, I would recommend it, but I, I have so many ideas in my head, I just don't have time to do it. It seems like I just want to just put pen to paper and do something new all the time. But I, I do think it's a really good way to learn things, and I teach my students to do it. It's my you know, Concept Design Academy. It's, um, we have a week on planes, car history, we do some mechs, um, military vehicles, and uh, I have them sketch just like you know a dozen cars from history over various eras like early 1900s cars 1940s mm-hmm. cars and then you know you start to get a feel of the aesthetic of every era so like early 1900s cars wood iron you know really simple production uh the aesthetic the feeling of them everything very delicate so if you want to transfer that kind of um kind of aesthetic emotion to other vehicles if you want to make a, a rocket ship that looks like it was made in the early 1900s. You have a feel of what stuff produced right. in that era. Um, but I think it's an important, it's an important process. I, these days, um, I look more at probably technique, you know, how, mm-hmm. um, like backgrounds are rendered, brushwork techniques, that sort of thing. That's kind of what I'm looking at. Awesome. Uh, another one of these pieces that I saw here that was, I thought was pretty interesting is, um, you engage with this uh, the sketch swap. You have the, you know there's another designer that creates the line work, and then you go and do the the rendering portion of it. So right. one of them here, there's a sketch swap of 2017. You've got the lines from Del Swanson, and yeah. then you've done the color. Tell me about that project. How did that kind of materialize? Where you're working with other people, and what kind of challenges did you see with with uh, doing something like this? So that started, um, as far as I know, with uh, Vaughn Ling, and uh, he goes by Heavy Polly on Instagram, and uh, Christian Pierce, who is uh, from New Zealand, works at the uh, Weta Studio, a uh, movie guy, does awesome, like hot rods and spaceships and all the stuff that I love. Uh, great sense of humor. This stuff is amazing. Um, but they did a, a sketch swap initially, and... Um, you know, Vaughn and I did a sketch swap after that, um, and I, I just kind of kept it going. So after I did it, um, you know, people saw it, and then I sketch swapped with uh, Dwayne Vance and uh, Damon Moran. Um, I'm going to forget a bunch of them. I, I've done so many. Michael Coos, uh, we're still working on that one. 
Uh, <laughs> there's actually like three that are kind of still ongoing, and it's kind of one of those things. It's like there's no there's no end date, so everybody's really busy. We get to them when we can. Uh, Dale Swanson's a hot rod guy, and yeah. Uh, a very yeah, he talented just, guy. Asked, yeah, he just wanted to do a, a sketch swap with me, so I said, "Oh yeah, sure." And he sent me three different ones, and um, the first two um, were pretty ordinary spaceships. And that one that I did was so unusual in mass. You know, that's what really appeals to me. It's just something that's really kind of kind of far out. I thought this will be a really good challenge. So, yeah, I, I rendered that one up, and uh, those generally could take, you know, maybe 12 hours in total. Um, wow. Um, you know, I, I mess around with doing some, some rough color comps first, and usually when I post them on Art Center or Behance or whatever, I, I try to put in some of the steps so you can kind of see the process of it. Um, but I, I was trying to, you know, you know, the challenge was to render the... Um, kind of industrial metal look and, uh, you know, make it really attractive. And uh, it was a very simple shape. So adding the design detail, the surface detail, and then, you know, that big kind of D-shaped thing, which I'm going to say is an anti-gravity device of some sort, um, reflecting back into the metal and the highlights from that. And, you know, there's all sorts of really kind of fun areas to to render up in that thing and then yeah. the background is a lot of fun too so I don't, I don't do kind of environmental or landscape stuff so you know making something that you know pulls away so the, the foreground image the, the vehicle itself is very tightly rendered super fine brushwork little you know you can see the um the scuffs in the metal that kind of stuff and then the background itself is more kind of painterly brush yep. stroke so it has a little bit of a blurred quality so it's got depth to it um, but the value contrast is always important, so this thing really pops. The color contrast as well, so the foreground is, is you know, generally just white and blue and bluish purple, and then you know, the background has this green, yellow kind of thing, so kind of cool on top of warm uh, contrast. Uh, but those are always really fun to do. You know, this, the sketch swaps are really... It's, it's good because you communicate with people and you work with people and they collaborate. And for people on either end, like when somebody renders yours up, like when Vaughn rendered up my, uh, uh, what we call it, a bull ship. Yeah, it's had horns on it, bull ship. <laughs> um, so yeah. when you get an email, it's like, yeah, I finished it. And they send it to you and you, you open it up and it's like, it's very familiar because it's your design. But then you see uh, their thought behind the interpretation you know, what color of the render, yeah. All the choices they made, it's it's the funnest thing, you know. Um, yeah, it gives it a whole new life, right? I mean, something yeah. that you haven't seen before or thought of, and they interpret it in a different way. They have a different thought process, but but yet yeah. it brings a whole new level of excitement to it. But at the same time, you, you spend, you know, hours looking at somebody else's um, illustration, their line work as well, so you become kind of, familiar with their thinking process a little bit, their aesthetic sense, their form language uh, bent, which, you know, everybody has their own kind of uh, line gesture, surface construction ideas. And so you're exposed to all sorts of, you know, creative stuff that you weren't exposed to before. And you, you learn by, you know, working with it. Um, it's kind of a sophisticated version of like adult coloring book thing, which <laughs> apparently is a rage of some sort, but yeah. a little more uh, artistically advanced version of it. I noticed an apple on this one. What's what's yeah. with the <laughs> what's the significance of the apple? Well, you know, I, I I'm rendering it up, and I I'm thinking, well, Dell didn't explain what any of this is, so I have to kind of create a story with it. So I went with this. Because he's a hot rod guy, he's like into the 50s, 60s stuff. Yeah. And there's a lot of a 50s, 60s uh, future um, show car feeling to things. So I'm thinking this is like secret Air Force uh, test vehicle, um, maybe captured UFO aircraft, uh, like anti-gravity technology. So the whole idea of the Apple is like... A, the representation of Newton, the apple fall 
falling on its head. And I can't remember, uh, I'm not looking at it right now, but is the apple falling up? Uh, let me go back and check that image. Uh... I, I think that was my idea. It's like instead of like gravity falling down, the apple's falling up or something. I, I don't remember exactly how it Falling did, up. But... Yep. Yeah. So that that's the whole idea behind that. So. Oh, that is cool. That is really pretty slick. Another then, one. Every, huh? Everyone's wondering on that one, the FU-801. Um, yeah. I actually got that directly off of some reference for, um, I was looking at Air Force fighters of that era and like what the um, yeah. the letters putting on there. So everybody thought there was some meaning behind that and there there isn't. <laughs> Another one of my favorites here, because I'm a huge Batman fan, but your Batmobile. And even here, you've got uh, your process. You got a, <laughs> this one, too. I mean, I'm, what I've noticed is that some of your larger ones materialize off of a very tiny little sketch. And this looks like yeah. it's been sketched in the back of an envelope. It is sketched in the back of an <laughs> envelope. And small little sketch, blowing it up, and then you create this masterpiece. It's uh, it's simply stunning. I remember when I was looking at this previously, there's a lot of kind of a Sid Mead type of look to it, especially with that red background. It's Yeah, the saturated environment color. I love it. Yeah, so tell me about this one. What kind of, you know, where did you get your inspiration for, for this particular rendering? And how long did this one take? Um. Yeah, it was, it was a while ago. It's probably about the same, same thing, uh, you know, maybe okay. 12 hours. So, um, kind of the ones that aren't so rendered fully, where it's a car and a white background, you know, not so much time involved, but, you know, I, because I'm not charging people for it, you know, I don't have to keep track of hours, so <laughs> you, you kind of lost in the, the process, but it's, they're usually done over the course of a few evenings or weekend afternoons kind of thing. Wow. Uh, so this one came about uh, through a uh, Facebook group. Um, headed by um, uh, Darko Markovic from uh, uh, Eastern Europe. Um, and he's like a kind of an entertainment design guy, mm -hmm. really, uh, you know, super energetic, artistic guy. And he got a whole bunch of people together and he started presenting these challenges that everybody kind of join in. And it was like a, a secret kind of invite only group. It's a bunch of really talented people, you know, it's pretty, pretty flattered to be invited to it. And through that, I met a whole bunch of um, designers from all over the world. Uh, a couple of really talented Brazilian guys. Um, Art Martins uh, goes by Dead Brush on, mm -hmm. uh, I think, Art Station, maybe, Behance, and he's on Instagram as well. Um but one of the challenges that we did was the Batmobile project, which is one of the funnest projects you do when you're at Art Center. Yeah. It's one of the kind of later term ones you look forward to. Um, and so I'm, I'm always cranking out kind of uh, just thumbnails and doodles all the time. You know, anytime I have a paper and pen in my hand, which you know, I, I keep a, a ballpoint in my pocket at all times. So lunch or when I get home, especially – you know, I'll, I'll bring in the, the junk mail and um, I'll just start sketching on the backs of the envelopes. So this is, I don't know if you have the camera up right now, but this is the, um, the sketch that uh, I used for that one. Oh, yeah. Show uh, me that again. One more time. Oh, yeah. So you can see, like, you know, <laughs> size it, about the size of my hand. So some of them, you know, the, the earlier ones I do that I'm just trying to get masks, they're about this big. Yeah. Uh, but I do like a light gray marker first and, you know, I'll do like maybe 20, 30, you know, just little scribbly kind of versions of different directions. And for this one, I didn't want to do the um, kind of Tumblr style, which is kind of military hardware. I yeah. wanted to do something that's a little bit more kind of comic book, 60s Adam West nostalgia with fins and stuff, but with some modern surfacing on it. Um, and then the scene kind of organically happened. So if, if you look at the art station, I think the process is in there or maybe yeah. I'll be um, but you can kind of see how I just, you know, I threw the, the sketch in there, scanned it in, and then I just started to throw a color on there. And I, I kind of, 
um, messed around with the background quite a bit, and I had the kind of the bluish color of the car, but it wasn't until I kind of brought in this red neon kind of um, uh, bad part of town lighting uh, street with the wet kind of decaying uh, asphalt and uh, kind of puddles on the ground. Um, and, you know, that that introduced, you know, a secondary color of the car. And then I think, if I remember correctly, there's some kind of golden color kind of coming from behind the viewer probably it's kind of hitting on the front fender and the, the yeah. wheels are lighting up a little bit with that <laughs> so you know for the bat batman stuff you know the the throwaway kind of aesthetic is just to make everything really drab but i want to do something really colorful by introducing all these other colors to it and then it's got you know the double bubble canopy is like the 1960s adam west batman kind of idea there's some weird perspective things with that drawing but you know, overall, I, I, I like it a lot. I think the the chrome of the wheels turned out pretty good, and, you know, it was a really fun one to do. And then a little bit of a scenario happening in the background, just you just see a couple of characters back yeah. there. Yeah, I was going to say, is that the Joker that I see? Yeah, a third read kind of thing. <laughs> I avoid drawing characters too much. It's not my forte, so. I don't know, man. This is really, uh, it's really pretty, uh, it's pretty slick. Um, and then there was a, uh, yeah, one of the other things that I've, I've noticed here is that, uh, this other one in particular, the, the, uh, anachronoid. Tell me about this one, because this reminds me a lot of these, you know, the old steam engines and things, but, uh, or locomotive, uh, but it's, uh, this one's like pretty interesting. It's actually, actually a little bit more looser than some of the other ones, the tighter ones that you've done. Yeah. Okay, so this one I don't remember. What does it look like? Um, this is it's a it's like a um, it's got the uh, the six wheels, all right. Okay. And, and it's basically kind of like a cigar shape. It's got uh, oh, it, it's the blue one, right? It's a yeah, blue. It's so got all the the engine exposed here in the front, and yeah. uh, it's also got the the little antenna. It's probably, again one of those uh, those uh, those droids, right? Right. So that's that's the one that was kind of the, the springboard to this Brewmeister stuff. So that's okay. the first one I drew without a driver. And so the whole idea of anachronoid, it's like anachronism. So early 1900s with some modern autonomous technology, you know, kind of impossible thing. But I just thought the shape was, you know, cool. You know, you, yeah, it is. Across six wheels, it's always going to make an impact on something. But like in that kind of early 1900s aesthetic and kind of wheel tire technology, open wheel layout. You know, when I drew it, I'm like, oh, that's, that's, that's pretty cool looking. You know, this this is something. And so, you know, that it went on to other things, of course. But Another one, super fuel detonation at a yeah. quarter mile. So cool, yes. man. That was that was another one that from Darko Markovic's uh, group, the uh, creative pot group, and it was – like a future drag race kind of scenario. Um, but yeah, it's just a lot of detail and, you know, I wanted to do kind of like some scenario where there's some explosion providing some backlighting and, you know, super ultra meaty tires on it, you know, kind of just taking the proportions and aesthetics of, you know, drag racing technology today and just pushing them to a little bit higher limit proportion yeah another yeah. one was that that i thought was pretty cool was the the bat buggy too yeah yeah there's been a a couple batman challenges so i've i've done some different versions um and sometimes if there's one challenge i'll actually you know do a couple finished renderings so um there's the whole desmo series of desmo dueler and desmo death and uh uh, there's another one, but I guess Desmodus is like, uh, I think with a Latin name for some certain kind of bat. So I was just kind of playing with the name and coming with some different ideas on that. And stunning. I love it. I love the neon sign and just the reflection Thanks. from from that. Uh, I mean, your sense of lighting, uh, just your reflection and saturation of colors. It's really just, my goodness, it just... I get excited every single time. It doesn't matter what you put out. I just, it's just, 
it gets me incredibly inspired. I mean, just yeah. amazing stuff. I want to yeah, switch. Yeah, there's all sorts huh? of guys I look at that, that, that inspire me all the time, too. It's like you can't get enough of the, the stuff that you know, pops up on Instagram and ArtStation. There's so much talent out there. Yeah, and it's very it humbling. Moving forward. Yeah. It's like, oh, that looks like they're having so much fun. I want to try doing <laughs> that kind of scene or whatever. So 12 hours, I mean, a lot of this stuff that you, you're working on, I'm, I'm assuming you're probably working on a Cintiq. So what are the kind of digital tools that you're using, the, your, your kind of your gear and your equipment? Um, my setup is pretty simple. So um, generally it's a kind of a, a combination. So I start on paper, you know, the, the back of the envelope sketching um, gets a lot of mileage. Um I just get like a ream of uh, color copy paper, and then I sketch on that with a uh, light gray copic and a um, uh, uh, what is it, paper mate uh, ballpoint pen, uh, just a black one. You know, th they're really cheap, but you know the angle um, change you can go from light to dark. So the really quality ballpoint pens they give you a really consistent line. It's like you don't want that. You want to be able to have like a really light line to kind of lightly sketch in and then you can be dark enough. So then I have a 17-inch flatbed scanner um, mm. that I can do a pretty good uh, scan of that. And then I go into Photoshop and I'm using um, CS, I guess it's 6 now, um, the last non-cloud version, <laughs> and running on a uh, 21 UX uh, Cintiq, which... Um, I've had this one probably since 2008, 2009, around there. Wow. So it's, uh, it's definitely paid for itself. You know, it's it's a friend of mine. You know, <laughs> I have a affinity of the equipment if it doesn't let you down. You know, I had to retire a pencil sharpener a few years ago, and it got me through. <laughs> you know, before de design school, design school, wow. all that, and it came to, you know, finally toss it in the trash. But it had done its job for so years so many years and finally stripped its gears yeah i so, have a pencil sharpener from from actually college that i still have panasonic yeah that was <laughs> yeah does yours have wood grain on it yes it does yeah <laughs> it's the same one. i got one. two it was that one and i got the black one <laughs> but i think the black yeah. one also has a, like a wood grain to it but yeah I, I almost wanted to save it but it, but uh yeah the the gear was stripped uh, the main gear, you know, but <laughs> now it's done its job and it's fine. It's a good excuse to get a really nice new one. I got a, a super nice handmade one from it, uh, northern Spain. Wow. I, I got to ask you, uh, some of your art center, uh, some of the renderings that you've done before are, yeah, I, they're just as stunning actually, but do you miss working with charcoal and, and working with traditional mediums? I know that you're doing more of the ballpoint and just the Copic, light Copic marker sketches and then scanning that in and then doing everything in Photoshop. But do you ever kind of go back and try to create watercolor uh, sketches or paintings or get a little bit more into uh, the fine art stuff or is it mostly just doing Photoshop? I mean, do you prefer just working with Photoshop now or do you think that there's value in just every once in a while hitting the traditional medium full scale. Yeah, I mean, there's been a few occasions in the last couple of years where, you know, we did like a, a sketch uh, competition where it was all kind of analog medium. And I kind of had to get back into that again, <laughs> large yeah. format, hands on and stuff. Um, to me, the, the end result is the thing that I miss. I miss having, you know, a physical... Um, paper that's got media on it so it's got yeah. marker that's bled a little bit it's got pencil that you know there's a little bit of tooth to the the colored pencil that's on there if you have some you know pastel on paper you know it gives you a different look and i i missed that um the process i i like the process of working digital better because it's so immediate and the control z is like one of the the greatest inventions of mankind really uh yeah. because like as an artist it allows you to experiment and mess around so back 
you know, in our center, pre-digital days, you had to do so many comps. Um, so, like, you do a line drawing, you take them to the copy shop and get a, a line drawing copy, a bunch of thumbnail size, and you do value studies and marker over those, and then you do some color studies on top of those, and then you would get into doing your finished 20-inch by 40-inch vellum rendering, right? which is a, a beautiful thing to behold, but, you know, there's it's working without a net, you know. You can spill a soda on it and you're done, or you can, you know, do your marker the wrong way. It's not going to come off. Uh, it's very unforgiving. Um, and these days, uh, I think, you know, design is not about art anyway. It's about, you know, producing ideas and, you know, communicating. So digital is so much quicker. Um and it's also easier to communicate with it, so you don't have to make copies and you know email them. It's it's already digital, so you can work with a client, you know, on the other side of the the world, no sure. problem immediately. And if if they want to make a revision to something, you know, in the gouache days, you would have to you know do some paste up stuff, and it was really quite difficult. But digitally, it's it's quite easy to change, you know, the whole color of a car. Or, you know, change the wheels out or something, you know. Um, and then the other thing is being able to do variations. Yeah. Quite easy. So if you want, you like the car, but you don't like the front ends that are on it, you can do, you know, a half dozen different front ends and have them all kind of stacked up. And you sure. and the team can decide which one is better. So um, there is nostalgia of, and I, I look at like Sid Mead stuff and, you know, um, Fitz and Van, you know, gouache illustrations all the time with that you know sense of awe of what they do but i i don't like to clean paint brushes <laughs> and I don't, I don't like to to go out and buy a gouache either i mean yeah digital equipment is pretty expensive but you buy it once and like the cintiq i've been using it for 10 years you know how much does a tube of gouache cost and then then you look at how much a sable brush costs and it's just like yeah <laughs> <laughs> But the, the cleaning of stuff and and also, you know, the workspace, you know, being able to scale stuff down. Like when I started Art Center, I had a, a mainline drafting board, which is what the engineers use. And it's like a, it's probably about 50, 60 inches wide, giant desk with a, a metal frame. Like when I moved down to L.A. to go to school, I'm like, if there's an earthquake, I'm getting under that desk. It's probably the <laughs> safest thing in the house. Yeah. Um, but you needed that space to do a 20 by 40 yeah. rendering was the standard for car illustrations back in the, you know, eighties, nineties before that probably even, um, cause you have 40 inches wide on your, your desk and then you have all your markers and chalk laid out and, you know, you got your, can of coca-cola to keep you going throughout the night and all that stuff it's just it's a lot of space it's a lot of mess and uh with a digital setup you know when i'm working on something over the course of evenings you know i, I power down and you know it's a little space and the next day I, I go there turn it on and it's all ready to go and uh especially you know i think one of the advantages i'm not in that tech uh level yet but creative cloud work um, potentially if you're working off site, you can work on something at work and then, you know, put on the cloud and work on at home, that kind of thing. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I completely agree. What do you think is going to, I mean, as far as, uh, college education, you think that the, the trend is going to, I mean, obviously the, the students have to be learning digital. Do you think there'll ever be a time where they don't even go to, drawing traditionally by hand that they do all their training on, on digital mediums or do you think you'll always have to to have the, the pen and the paper and, and and make sure that they understand those fundamentals from 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 just a uh, you know ideation standpoint yeah yeah I think there's really it's it's really important to start with a, an analog kind of uh, technique education first um, because all the digital stuff is a replication of that with added digital superpower, you know, on top of it. But, right. uh, being able to draw on a napkin, you know, the, 
the napkin sketches, they, they talk about that all the time. It's like your, your inspiration can come at any time and having to go to a particular place or, you know, rely on a piece of technology, um, is really kind of limiting. So even like, uh, you know, you're in a meeting, you, you do a lot of whiteboard sketches to kind of explain things and, you know, you're drawing sections of, you know, you're doing like seat design or something. Right. How the, the frame of the seat fit over there and you're, you're kind of working organically on that shape and, you know, erase a little bit and then add. And, and, um, if you have to like turn on a program and get people to go to a certain room, special room in the studio, because that one device is in that room, uh, it's very, very limiting. Um, but I think a lot of, um, Drawing is uh, a physical skill, just like playing basketball or archery or whatever. I agree. And uh, swiping a pen and hitting a target, you know, we do that all the time. So if, if you want to draw the body side of a car or a vehicle or something, you're going from a point A to point B. And if you're not able to hit that target, you're going to be redrawing it over and over again. And to learn that on paper... Um, you're not worried about the scale of the screen, you know, being so limiting. So, you know, drawing large and using your shoulder yep. is really important and using all the joints and sequence and figuring out the best way to kind of move your body to get a particular line the way it is. Because particularly automotive um, design is all about a gesture of movement. So you have a lot of kind of producty kind of style, but at the same time, kind of the more fluid, you know, traditional sports car stuff, it all comes from a, a, a physical gesture on paper, you know, transferred down there, um, you know, ink stroke with your arm. You know, that's where the movement comes from. So digital kind of, it's not as natural to replicate that. Right. So even, even you know, using Cintiq for many, many years, um, I still am much more, it feels much more natural to sketch on paper. That's why I do my, my line drawings on paper. It's a different process. Um, there's been a lot of uh, discussion with the Internet and the proliferation of people learning more based on just availability of uh, whether it's courses or just inspiration with pictures that are all over the place. And, mm -hmm. and with college, uh, I don't know what it is at Art Center, but I know that a lot of the design schools, especially private design schools, are, are pretty expensive. What do you yeah. think is the, the sort of the future with all this, uh, with uh, with all these offerings and, and people being able to, to take courses now online, what do you think is the, the future of, of online learning and what do you think are the, the sort of the, the advantages and maybe the disadvantages, if you will, learning online? Yeah, so there is a whole lot of content online to learn how to draw well and uh, make some great sketches of cars. Um, and unfortunately, I think what uh, the online kind of car design and design in general community has has kind of pushed is this whole um, kind of focus on the killer looking sketch. And so when you go to Art Center, that's not all you do. And I think people don't understand what industrial design is. Like we talked about before, the whole idea yep. about you know feasibility that goes into things and form. You know, you know, I went to Art Center and I. I could draw really well, but, you know, one of the things that, you know, I didn't focus enough on was the whole design aspect of it. And so you don't see that online so much. You see a lot of technique, um, but the logic and the thought that goes behind it is missing. And when you get a degree at an art school, um, like Art Center is a Bachelor of Science degree, you're taking a lot of um, courses, um, that support you as a designer. So um, there's math stuff, so you can communicate and understand what engineers right. are talking about, for example. Um, lettering class, 
uh, which is really interesting. So you're, you're copying letter forms by hand. You're drawing letter forms. So when you draw a serif, like a Bodoni font, uh, B or a D or something or an S, you're looking at line relations. So you're, you're seeing like the outside of one line, how it relates to the other side of the line and how curves relate to each other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is all through repetitive process in the typical design school fashion where you're, you're doing, you know, a ton of assignments every week and working all night and getting these, you know, driven into your brain. Yeah. And if you're doing things online, it's like usually people are picking this stuff that appeals to them. So they'll, they'll look at, you know, oh, here's a class to draw spaceships and they're drawing the spaceships. Mm -hmm. But those types of people probably aren't going to take that dry stuff like lettering class. They won't be interested in it. Right. So you have to go to a school where you take these classes that you don't enjoy, but they're really foundational for you as yeah. a designer. So that's part of this. The whole process is, is doing the, uh, what's the, the karate kid, you know, wax, the uh, wax car on, wax off. Yeah. That's a it's, great it's analogy. It's not yep. fun, and you don't understand it as as a young artist or young designer until the very end. And that's one of the things you get get out of design school, and you're in the industry for a while. It's like, oh, I understand what they were talking about and why that was so important. Like you sketch and draw cones and <clears throat> spheres like for years. Yeah, it's like it never goes away. <laughs> but it's it's all essential stuff because it's like this is how you light a surface, and you know the cones and spheres are you know, the basis for a lot of the shapes, and a lot of the form language, you know, they get stretched and uh, pumped up with air so they have volume. And, um, but if you understand, you know, basic lighting technique, you know, you can use that forever because, you know, physics don't change. Yep. The way the light interacts with an object never changes. So you can learn from the way that people were rendering stuff in the 40s and 50s, you know, it still applies. Exactly. Exactly. One of the other questions that I get from from people who are uh, maybe they're in engineering or they're they're involved in a design in a curriculum that they're not uh, too fascinated with, or they feel that they want to get back into something that may might be more passionate about, like automotive <laughs> design. Uh, one of the questions, though, is that some of these people that they they they're a little bit older. And their, their, their question is, at what point is it sort of too old for you to, to get into automotive design? And, and is it even worth it uh, if they were to do something like that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a hard question because you always want to follow your dream, but you have to be realistic about it as well. So um, at any point in your life, your age or whatever, you have to be very realistic about, um, you know, the time and the costs there are in, you know, that's going to be involved with, you know, getting out of a design school with an education, which is still kind of what you need to get a, a good job. Right. You know, because employers are looking for that degree because that's an endorsement for all those lettering classes and, and all the stuff that they don't see in your portfolio. Um, but, you know, as difficult as it is, it's achievable if you put your energy into it. It's just very hard. So, you know, for someone in their 20s to go through Art Center, it's it's essentially art boot camp. It's very, very difficult. So, yeah. you know, it's long, long nights and, uh, you know, endless assignments and, uh, you know, you have homework in you know, five different classes every week and you start to learn about time management and all that. But if you're kind of later in your life and your career and you have a family, um, they have to be on board with you too, because you're not going to have time for them. So yeah, they have to support your, pa your, your passion. So when I went to school, there was, um, you know, a couple of my friends had, had gotten married before and they had kids and stuff and, and they actually did really well. And, but it wasn't easy. <laughs> so, um, sure. I think people just need to know that it is really tough to do. And then, 
at the end of your education, of course, is getting a job. Yeah, it's, it's no guarantee. A very competitive industry, and um, you know the timing of when you graduate, you know, could make a huge difference depending on what the economy is doing. So you know, auto studios might be hiring a lot one year, and you know, like 2008 around there after yeah Lehman and the economy went down it's like they weren't hiring at all so um it's good to be i, I think i just want to reiterate that you have to be very realistic about things and yeah. really listen to people so don't um you know do all your prep work and, and uh kind of uh sketching everything in a vacuum it's like you have to have a good ear for criticism and and that's another thing about being a good designer is, um, you know, you can't take it personally when somebody says, you know, that works not good. I don't like it or whatever, because it's an, it's an industry of empathy. You know, if you're an artist, you're making work for yourself. And if it sells, then you're rich and you're lucky, but you're always doing whatever you want to do. But being a designer is making other people happy, your customer, your boss, yeah, the team, all of that. So, you have to be always listening, um, and and keep a, an open mind about you know if somebody wants a change, you know let's look into making that change because it's going to improve the product. Sure. But um, yeah, you can't kind of go in there with that uh, without really listening to people and being realistic about things because more people want to be car designers than there are jobs that exist. Yeah. Um, that's just kind of the way it is. Yep, I agree. Uh, I agree. But there are fallback professions as well. If you don't get into car design, you know, there's you can start to look at uh, you know product design, huge huge industry, uh, you know, video game stuff, uh, movie design, you know, conceptual design, yeah, uh, HMI design. So a lot of the foundational stuff you learn about color, aesthetics, form. All that can apply to a lot of different fields. So, um, you know, there's always options out there. Last question: uh, Future of transportation design. What do you think is the impact uh, on car design with OEMs embracing autonomous vehicles? Um, it's still pretty far out there. Um, <laughs> the autonomous vehicles haven't been, you know, doing such a great job yet um it's probably coming so the, the big question is like uh will the government decide that all vehicles have to be autonomous if they're you know driven on a, a public road and that's what would make it a giant change so for people that live in the city you know it, it makes logical sense to be able to kind of hop in a pod and and yeah. uh, commute you can watch Netflix or, you know, work on some of your actual work before you get to work and be on the clock. Um, but then there's a very large part of the country that is more rural and uh, farmers and such, and they don't need autonomous vehicles as much. It's not, it would be a luxury item probably. Yep. Um, yeah. But it's, it's very unclear, but, uh, you know, big, big changes are definitely happening. And um, another thing is like uh, the decline in car ownership as well. So if you're uh, basically using an app on your phone to just call up a vehicle to hop in to get across town and you don't own a car, um, do you care what it looks like, the vehicle you're getting into? Um, because if, if that's the case, then, you know, it could be very kind of producty looking uh, shapes very simple, like because you, you don't yeah. care, you know. Optimized the, the for you know real estate right inside. Right. So very likely it'd be a cube with um, LED uh, screens on the outside for advertising. So little rolling billboards you climb inside. So uh, I think the the whole desire to control your own vehicle is it's tapping into something that's goes beyond culture so it's just like riding a horse or something being able to manually control something that need is going to be there for a lot of people so where that gets displaced too is going to be a good question you know 
because there are a lot of people that are going to really hold on to that as much as possible. But just as the, the horse went away on public roads, it may be, the car may be a plaything for the wealthy. So you go to the racetrack and you drive your car, but you'll never be able to drive a car in the street anymore. Um, That's scary. In any case, <laughs> yeah. In any case, I, I will be drawing my own fantasy vehicles in an alternate dimension. And <laughs> So right now, the, the you know the Screwmeister stuff, it's like I'm seizing upon what autonomous could be. Yeah. You know? you know, every car looks different. Why not? Because you're watching it racing. You want it to look good. Because you're not rooting for a driver anymore. You're you're rooting for the the car that looks the coolest, the way you think. So there is some subjectivity there. Um, I, it's exciting. I think I think the biggest kind of exciting change about autonomous is what interiors are going to be like. Because, you know, you don't need to have your control area facing forward anymore. You yeah. can be sitting backwards or reclined or something. If, if an autonomous vehicle doesn't get any accidents anymore, you don't need to wear a seatbelt, perhaps. You can, you know, take a nap. You can uh, be on a bar stool eating a sandwich and watching a movie in kind of a tall van or something. Yeah. Or, who knows? I think there's tons of opportunities there. Yep. Sky's the limit. Yeah. So I've got to tell you, I mean, this has been really a lot of fun. I learned a lot. Uh, you're obviously a tremendous talent, and I think a lot of people are going to uh, walk away from this getting a lot of information and really understanding uh, what drives you, uh, the things that you've done to be successful in your career. And uh, what people need to do if they are uh, considering a, a career path in, in design or transportation design, you know, what mm -hmm. are the sort of things that they need to consider, uh, whether they are just entering it from, from high school or whether they are uh, a little bit more matured and want to look at a different career path or a different career change. I mean, everything comes with with uh, pros and cons and and I think you make a lot of great valid points that you know these are a lot of things that you have to kind of outweigh and be realistic about uh, certain things especially about your future and 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 you know what's really plausible uh, but I wanted to thank you I think it's been you know it's been a real treat to, to kind of get inside your head and understand how uh, you look at the world and how you create some of these fantastical images so i gotta say i really appreciate your time and and uh and discussing uh your whole process and your history and your background and uh hopefully we'll uh uh we got to connect again uh soon with any new projects you're doing and just talk about uh yeah. some more design talk and share a lot more of your work in the future sure so yeah thank you so Arvin, I mean, this was like, it felt super brief and I feel like we, there's probably a, a ton of questions. So <laughs> if you ever want to do it and, and, and you get like a hundred questions set your way, we can start picking at them. Yeah, uh, we'll definitely do uh, that. So where else can people find you aside from uh, Art Station? In fact, we'll probably put a link to your Instagram uh, account right. and where we can find you. But uh, uh, you got Art Station, you probably got Behance. Yeah, I had a, uh, I don't have it with me, but um, I have, like, all this, the sites, they link to each other. So the Art Station page has links to my Instagram, I think. Okay. And, um, I also have, like, a main website. I don't update it so much, but it has links to everything. It's uh, frywork.com. So it's uh, F-R-Y-E-W-E-R-K. Okay. Awesome. Um, and then that's my Instagram handle as well. And um, I love to answer questions. I, I like to help the young designers out, the new new designers, um, if I have time. But I, I generally uh, try to respond. So, um, yeah, drop me a line or whatever. And, again, Arvin, thanks so much for the interview. It was a lot of fun. Hey, I had a great time. And I think that, uh, you know, hopefully – we get some more time, and then uh, we'll uh, definitely have another chat again. Yeah, and I'd love to sketch with you sometime. The stuff you've been doing lately is, is awesome. Uh, we'll, John, we'll you're, you're uh, 
I think you're being a little too kind. <laughs> no, it's some great stuff, especially the 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 paper stuff you're doing as well. It's just uh, I need to do more of that, probably. I appreciate that. I appreciate. It. I like, like I said, I like it. I have a lot of fun because it's. You know, I just enjoy connecting with the medium and uh, it's like a relationship, you know, I just, you feel that relationship, you feel that connection and just, it just, it just grounds me a little bit. So it yeah. just kind of keeps me in the game, especially with, you know, how busy we are at work. So, right. Well, that is the conclusion of our interview with John Fry. I hope you enjoyed this interview and you got a lot out of it. Uh, be sure to uh, post your comments and even your questions and I'll be sure to let John know that you guys have additional questions and perhaps we can get onto YouTube or even to the blog to uh, answer those questions. So be sure to, to comment on our page and uh, hope you enjoyed this and I'd uh, love to see you here next time on Driven to Draw. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Uh, tell all your friends about it if you find this content uh, useful and you find that you are learning uh, a lot and uh, we'll see you here next time on Driven to Draw. Have a good one.